Okay, let's start. Uh, so, um, so I... is, is, is my noise better? No. no. Okay, hopefully, hopefully it will not be recorded so much, but I think I can hear you better uh, now. At least for now. Okay. Uh, so, but the, the, the problem is, even though we can hear you clearly, but we can also hear those children very clearly. All right. Maybe uh, you can unmute yourself only when you need to okay. speak. Okay, that's a good idea. Okay, maybe I briefly introduce what uh, Rofan will be present here. So basically, it was using uh, working on the topic as a metric event. So, so I, I hope that a lot of us know what is assignments model. So basically, uh, once we're talking about assignments model, we talk about the neural network model. The neural network model basically is uh, representation learnings. We, if we just compare two images, how similar they are. So if we look into the pixel level, uh, it is too, too much irrelevant details will be taken into consideration. In this case, uh, deep neural network model, basically it is actually learning a representation. You're trying to <clears throat> transform a images or a text or something else, maybe the traffic, the network traffic into a representation, a vector representation. So we just need to compare those vectors. And those vectors have the property like it will be easy to be classified and easy to can be compared with the similarity. So the process of such a learning such a transformation functions is basically more like a process of learning the deep learning model. So we have some program machine is working on how the model is trying to learn such a visualize how, how visualize the, the training process that was Shani is doing. And the rule of is more focused on uh, whether we can have a better approach for the deep metric learning or such a representative, such a representation learning here. And the topic here we're talking about a proxy synthesis. So maybe we're um, less relevant to uh, give us more details. Okay. Mm. Today I will present the paper proxy synthesis learning with synthetic classes for deep metric learning. This work is published in AAAI this year. The authors are three Korean guys from Naver and uh, Line Corporation. The first two authors, they are co-author, co-first author for this paper. Their research interests are computer vision, metric learning. But the last author, his research interest is speech, uh, or signal or something. Yeah. Okay, please go on. Hmm. So I I think uh everyone know what is classification task. In classification tasks, we want to classify something to <clears throat> known classes according to some shared characteristics. For example, given an image of a dog, we want to classify uh, which animal is it, what type of animal it is. One restriction is that the test set shouldn't contain any unseen classes that is not covered by the training set. In contrast, metric learning is to learn a similarity function to quantify the similarity between instances. A image will go through an embedding network and then the embedding vector is directly used to compare the similarity between other images. An application scenario is image retrieval. So given a query image, I'm going to find the most similar image in gallery set. Since the output is, is some similarity, so the test set can contain unseen classes. Okay, I think this is quite straightforward and everyone feel free to raise questions here. In metric learning, there are mainly two categories of losses. First one is pair-based loss. Um, pair-based loss is defined, usually defined on a triplet. 
every time I will take an anchor image. Here is an anchor image. It's just a random image from your training set. And then I will select a positive image. This is a positive, which, which belongs to the same class as anchor. I will also select a negative image from another class. So they form a triplet. And the triplet loss is to minimize the distance between anchor and positive. And, and in, um, at the same time, maximize the distance between anchor and negative. The disadvantages are very obvious. Uh, firstly, if we consider all the possible triplets we can have, is n choose three, so it's of order of magnitude n cube. Secondly, it may introduce some overfitting problem because every time the model only see three images at a time and try to optimize on it. It ignores the global geometry. I'm, I'm sorry, what do you mean by uh, global geometry? Oh, because the loss is only defined on three images mm -hmm. instead of considering all the images. Um. So, so do you mean that if any samples from other class, it would be the same, it would be considered, considered the same? Oh. Hmm? Uh, uh, maybe I can uh, explain it a little bit. So if we have a sample, so, so that is the problem is that the number of triplet samples we can have just what I mentioned, each time we need to find an anchor and we need to find a positive sample and find a negative sample, right? So in this case, the potential, uh, the whole set of potential set will be very large. So it is not realistic that we can take all the uh, triplet combinations during the training. So we have to somehow have to miss something, right? And when we miss something, it means that we may, based on such a triplet sampling strategies, we may not care about Take it, take into all the uh, combinations into the training process. We somehow have to miss something, and some mm -hmm. samples may. It is possible that we we keep sampling, uh, keep sampling one kind of triplet, uh, for a few times, but some mm -hmm. other triplet will be missed for, well, it will not be trained forever. Mm -hmm. That means we may have may we have a chance to looking uh, investigating or training the local. Uh, geometry and do not have a big picture of the global geometry. Mm -hmm. I assume that that's what what that means. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Mm, yeah, I, I got it now. Mm, mm. Thank you. So to solve the problems in pair-based laws, the second category of metric learning is proxy-based laws. They will introduce a proxy and the proxy are served as the representative embedding for each class. So for each class, they will have a single proxy. You can understand it as a, some kind of centroid. So this will represent the whole class here. And then instead of finding a positive and negative image, uh, it will just find a proxy corresponding to the own class as a positive anchor and the rest are negative anchor and try to minimize the distance between anchor and a positive, a positive proxy, maximize the distance between anchor and negative proxy. Uh, sorry, I have to enable and mute and unmute myself from any time. If there's a silence, you can just keep going. Oh, by the way, is there any questions about the proxy based laws? Sorry, uh, just a question in general about the, the two categories. What exactly is an anchor? Oh, um, anchor is the, the data image you start from. Because the positive is defined based on what the class of anchor is, a negative is defined based on the class of anchor. So here, I think the idea is that giving two images, if it is similar, 
and the neural network model should generate the similar uh, vectors for them. And if they're dissimilar, the network should be transformed into a dissimilar vectors, right? So if we want to have these properties, we somehow have some reference. Suppose we know these images, we find images similar to it, and we find another images dissimilar to it. And then we should uh, maximize the distance between between these images and its dissimilar images, and then minimize the distance between these images and its similar images. So that is the basic idea how the network trying to learn. Yes. Is there uh, any question here? No, oh, yeah, the explanation makes sense. Thanks. Okay, uh, here, uh, I, I hope everyone understands what is the anchor or what is the proxy there means, right? But how to obtain the proxy? Uh, it's jointly learned with the embedding network. Okay. You can consider it as some kind of weight. Okay. Mm. Okay, maybe, uh, uh, Rafa, you can summarize. So, oh, okay, Xiangling, please. Uh, um, I just noticed that um, maximize anchor to proxy. What? Um, uh, uh, this is the distance because you want to pull the positive proxy closer to the anchor image you are looking at. Oh, oh, oh I see. I see. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Mm. So, um, most of proxy based laws adopt this self max laws. So, here you can see the numerator. This S means the similarity between X and the, the positive anchor. So you want to maximize the numerator with respect to the denominator. Denominator is the sum of all similarity between the anchor and all the proxies. Okay, so I think this quite clear. Is there any question here? That means for each sample, it should be close to its own its, its own proxy. It should be far from its different proxy, right? And I think uh, Dr. Shaiyan raised the question: How to how do we derive the proxy? Mm -hmm. and I think and that it will be covered later. Hmm. Okay, yeah. if there is no question, let's let's keep continuing. So here maybe I can ask the question. Okay. Um, proxy-based laws can lower the complexity. Remember that for pair-based, the complexity is n choose three. Then uh, what about using proxy? What is the complexity? Okay, uh, this seems a good question and uh, real fun. But any, any volunteers for this question? Is it n times k square? Um, k n times k. K. Uh, k. Yeah. K. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So suppose there are k classes, then there will be k proxies. So it's n times k. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And also, I think the proxies are like high level abstraction of each class. So each time the anchor will look at all the proxies. Mm. So it, it can look, um, it can better represent the global geometry instead of looking at some single instances. So here is the comparison between two types of laws. In this paper, they attack the state of the art by saying that although proxy-based laws can reduce overfitting, but there might still be risk of overfitting because ideally metric learning want to generalize well on ascent classes but so far, all proxy-based laws and pair-based laws are only trained on training set, which only cover known classes. So the paper wants to generate some synthetic classes during training, 
to simulate the behaviors of enzyme classes. To answer this question, they proposed a novel regularizer for proxy-based loss. They call it proxy synthesis. It can improve the generalization ability by considering the class relations and smoothing the decision boundary. It is simple because it only uses linear interpolation to generate the synthetic classes. And they also argue it is uh, flexible, so it can be applied on any proxy-based loss. And they, they also show that using proxy outperforms existing proxy-based loss. Hmm. The approach is inspired by the idea in input mix-up. So input mix-up is a data augmentation technique in classification tasks. Uh, for example, given a, given a cat and a dog, so here is their one hot label. They will generate a new image by linear interpolation between the two images. And the label for the new image is also by using linear interpolation. Okay, I think this quite straightforward. Uh, let's keep going on. And yeah, and so the synthesized images would be considered as a new uh, samples and proxy, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a question here. Mm -hmm. So usually, how many classes do you have when you change the proxy of when you change this approach? Depending on the data. Um. So so some some have... will have hundreds, some will have thousands. Oh. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. If it's hundred, the combination was this is supposed to be huge, right? Yeah, but they do it like batch by batch. So when they train, they they do the linear interpolation batch by batch. So mm -hmm. for one batch, maybe there are not that many synthesis I got it. I got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, proxies, so proxy synthesis also use the linear interpolation, but it's on the intermediate embedding, not on the input. Step one is they select two embedding, Xi and Xj, from two different classes. And also, they can get the proxies corresponding to the two classes. Step two is they will generate new embedding by doing linear interpolation and also generate new proxies. So here, the mix-up coefficient should be the same. Mm, so. Is that possible that the synthesized the proxy actually very close to another proxy? Yeah, right. it's so, possible. So, 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 yes. yeah. yeah, yeah. So the point the point is that uh have the authors have the way to find that the synthesized proxy is actually a new is not a new proxy. Is there actually some proxy we have already seen? Uh have the author got this problem or the chances for such phenomena is small. Hmm. I think he doesn't care whether the synthesis proxy is redundant or not. Hmm. And what if it's redundant and what is consequence? Or well, there's just no consequence? If it's not, we not only, we not only synthesize the proxy, we also synthesize the sample, right? And then yeah. not only the pseudo proxy, we also have the pseudo, pseudo samples. Uh, does that make sense that the mixed up the, the, the mixed up the, the, the images, uh, the mixed up images that actually really falls on the manifold? That's not necessary for on the manifold. So it's just trying to write a few pseudo code. Maybe it's the major idea that they're trying to enlarge the space, yeah. the geometric space between the proxies so that it can have more space to tolerate the unseen classes. Yeah. Do you yeah. think that is the reason to do this? Yeah, I think it's the reason. Yeah. It, do it doesn't care whether the embedding, general embedding is meaningful, has real meaning or not. You just and, want to fill mm -hmm. the gap between. And if, and for example, let me, see, let me imagine it. Mm -hmm. If we already have another proxy 
uh, like, like PX here. Uh, let me annotate it here. So suppose we already have the, a proxy. We say the PX here. And when we have the PX here, suppose this synthesized proxy is very close to the original proxies. Will the training process have a way to enlarge their space? Uh, for example, it will actually move another proxy away there or move the proxies to the other space. Right, because you can think about it, the, the synthesized examples seem to be seem to fall into another category, right? And the, the based on the metric learning process, the space will be further enlarged. Actually, I think uh, the proxy generated during this batch will not be reused in next batches. So I uh, think but the, the point, classes will uh, not go. So yeah. Your point is that when we synthesize a new proxy, and it will be thrown away after one batch iteration. Oh, yeah. It will only used for this batch. Otherwise, the number of uh, synthetic yeah. cuts will grow. OK, I got it. Let's keep yeah. going on. Mm -hmm. OK, let's keep going on. Any questions here? So here you can see they do this uh, batch by batch. So in every batch, they will generate a fixed number of synthetic proxies and synthetic embedding. And they append it to the current training, training data. But for next batch, the synthetic embedding and proxy will be dropped and they will generate new ones. Okay, that is uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, how how could you set mu? Uh, mu is a fixed hyperparameter that need to be set before training. Okay. Mm. So each for each iteration, you just generate additional new batch, right? Yeah. Uh, for each one batch, each batch um, it will generate additional new batch of the synthesized sample and keep training. Okay. So that seems to make sense. Oh, by the way, does this approach is the best baseline? No. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's keep going. The technique and the story makes sense story, to me. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it has a discussion on why does using linear interpolation increase the generalization ability. Uh, by a previous work called Manifold Mixup, they find that the smoothness of decision boundary is the main factor of generalization. And applying proxy synthesis has the effect of smoothing the decision boundary. But to see this, the paper, they use the artificial 2D Gaussian data and, and visualize what happens before and after using the proxy synthesis. Uh, in their artificial data set, they will have three classes, a red class, gray class, and blue class. And they are, uh, they are on a two-dimensional multivariate Gaussian distribution. If, if Z is large, then it is colored red. If Z is low, then it's colored as blue. If Z is in between, then it's a gray, gray class. Yeah. Uh, one, one, of, one, of, one of the questions I have yeah. is, <clears throat> now we're working on the metric learning. Right. Yeah. So by rights, they're not supposed to be have the decision boundary. Oh and yeah. But because they... because if you look at the loss, it's a softmax based, right? So you can compute the confidence for each for each class. Yeah. So basically, the, the, the so called smoothness is how far away two classes are. Can we think in such a way? How how far away? Yeah, how far away? So suppose uh two classes are entangled together, so mm. it is it is kind of the uh unsmooth boundaries. But if two classes classes are very far away, and uh, they're a very clear boundary, and this boundary is supposed to be smooth, is that is that a basic idea? Mm, yeah. 
Uh, yes or no? I still in the middle. Did you know some I, I so think to, to because, uh, from what I understand, uh, maybe I, I first explain this. Mm. So when they train the network, they only train on red and blue cars. So the gray cars are considered as unseen, right? And the gray cars are distributed here in a circle. And the red cars is at center and the blue cars cover the rest of area, right? So it's just building this ground truth data from the top. It will be like this. And then the, the color here, the color here is actually the confidence from the model. So you can see if without the proxy synthesis, there will be a very thin decision boundary. Decision boundary means uh, in this region, the model is very un unconfident. The confidence may be near 0 0.5. But for other area, the confidence is quite large, which means that softmax tend to produce overconfident results here. But after the proxy synthesis, you can see the decision boundary is wide, is widened, which means that in this region, the model is uncertain. So that's why they, they say that using proxy synthesis, they will have a relaxed estimate of uncertainty for the unseen classes. Well, basically, it seems to me it's more like a more like a data augmentation approach, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. More sense of a very specialized data augmentation approach, which is used to improve the confidence of the same class, right? Maybe we can somehow- Actually, learn. it also mm -hmm. decreased the confidence here, right? Because it's lighter now. But before, maybe it's too confident, so you want to decrease it a little bit. Mm, but I think this demo example is like Correct. specific, specifically designed to uh, fit into their setting. What if there's the gray class is outside, um, for example? Uh, but there will still be a boundary, right? No, I mean, um, like if uh, if outside this circle like this area belongs to the gray class, what happens? What would happen? Uh, then this, this decision boundary will be wider. But, but you only have proxy in this region. Oh. You, you don't, because there is no other class outside of blue point. So in this case, yeah. there's, there's no yeah, way to find yeah, it's the totally it totally uh, depends on on how how representative <clears throat> our <clears throat> generate synthesize the property is, right? So yeah. I think Dr. Xiaoyin's work on a research project is also very interesting. So the idea is that uh, we still want to have a better metric learning, right? So uh, the idea is that whether we can take it, learn some transformation which can be generalized the other transformation. So, so maybe we, if we have interest, we can talk more about that. So we have, so I think the rationale here is that uh, the first we want to learn a more precise distribution by have more data orientation. And the second is that maybe the approach is hopefully by looking to and training on those synthesized uh, uh, proxies and samples they somehow can be representative and generalizable to the other NC class. So that is an assumption, but they not be right. But mm -hmm. in the future, maybe we can look into look, look forward more, for example, what is the most intuitive uh, synthesis? What we mixed up, right? So we have the more data, whether we can base on some of the other knowledges to synthesize more meaningful data for those NC class, right? So whether we can have a unified, for example, the knowledge base or the knowledge graph for us to further indicate the transformable and the generalizable uh, augmented data, right? Mm. Okay. Okay, let's keep going on. So 
the experiment set up means they, they use four data sets. And the training set consists of 50% of total classes. They will, um, they will use this set of classes as known classes. And in the testing set, all the classes are unsaid. The evaluation metric they use is recall as one. That means for a query image from testing set, I'm going to find its first nearest neighbor in testing set itself, except for itself. Then check whether the nearest neighbor has the same class label as itself. Excuse me, I ask uh, mm -hmm. which kind of distance used in the nearest uh, neighbor? Can you use cosine? Also can cosine. use Euclidean. So you mean that one, one training also use cosine? Uh, for example, oh, one training yeah. use cosine to check the distance, then use cosine in test. But if you use yeah. uh, Euclidean in, in training, then use Euclidean here, test, right? Yeah. OK, thank you. Mm. So first, they visualize where the synthetic process and synthetic embedding are. We can look at graph B. So the green points are the synthetic embedding, and the red star are the synthetic process. And graph A shows the pink, the pink points. The pink points are the real testing set. So they find that- So they the, really show that uh, the unseen classes falls in between those same classes. Mm. Right, so mm. that means the generalization actually really work. Uh, and by the way, how do they do the visualization? Mm. Uh, it Tisney. seems like you, Tisney. All right, okay. Okay, let's keep going on. And this table is, they, they want to evaluate uh, whether uh, I only generate synthetic embedding or do I only generate synthetic proxy or I generate both embedding and proxy. And they find the, the hybrid one is the best. but just to improve the 1% of the accuracy. Yeah, so I find that their performance does not bring great improvement, but only minor improvement. Uh, just improve the 1% of accuracy, and we have a new yeah. state of the art. Yeah. Okay. Uh, may I, um, hmm. uh, excuse me, may I ask? Uh, let's see the visualization here, because mm -hmm. you can see the training embedding and the Testing embedding, I mean the green one, uh, left side. Yeah. The uh, green one and the, did they say pink? Mm -hmm. uh, the, because they are very, uh, that doesn't mean that actually it didn't have a good performance uh, to distinguish between classes. Can I think like this? Because they are very um, in chaos because some, for example, uh, you use the proxy, I mean, the blue one, there are, for example, there are 50 proxy here. When the, does it mean there are 50 classes here? Yes, 50 <laughs> classes in training. Okay, so mm -hmm. uh, wait for a moment. I think it doesn't matter if the test embedding are not cluster well, as long as, because the metric they clear is recall at one. So as long as the nearest neighbor, it has the mm -hmm. same class, then it is a success. Okay, but for example, here, uh, can you see the annotation? Uh, for yeah. example, they are very close. Does, does it mean there are two classes here, but cannot distinguish them? Yeah. Cannot distinguish. Okay. And by the way, for testing set, it means does it mean that we keep a reference? So we keep we keep the galleries. And even if those testing samples have never been trained by the network, and we still find no. it, it's best no. and it's it's required one, it's still correct, right? Yeah, so the gallery because the gallery set is testing set itself. 
So it guarantees that in the gallery, it has, it has some instances with the same car set. The training? Right. Uh, or, or, or the The car is from testing, and the gallery is also testing. So you will find some instances with the same cars, right? You are guaranteed to have someone in gallery. Oh, I understand, definitely. Yeah. So I'm just mm -hmm. saying, I'm just asking is that the testing set actually contains, um, yeah, so all the data, so I just confirmed that all the data in the testing set has never been trained. Never been uh, trained. Uh, all the classes have never been trained. All the, yeah. So these two are class destroyed. Training and testing are class destroyed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's keep continue. Okay. So what, what, also, is the, what is uh, the baseline? Baseline? Yeah. Baseline is do one. not use any synthetics. Just using normal proxy. Yeah, just no, using normal. They do not compare with the triplet. They do not. Triplet is. They think, they think triplet has a, yeah. They think triplet is an obsolete approach. Yeah, obsolete. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Okay. They also investigate the effect of whether fixing the lambda. Lambda is the mix-up coefficient when we do the interpolation. Whether we fix a lambda or we generate it from some random, we randomly sample it from some distribution. And they, they find that uh, random lambda is better. Uh, you mean the since when we mixed up the, the degree of mix, right? Yeah. And, and, and when the lambda is 1.5, what does it mean? The, uh, oh, this is the parameter of the distribution you are Okay, oh, okay. Mm. So, yeah. <laughs> why, why, is, uh, why stochastic generation is better? Is there an explanation? Mm. Mm, I think then you can generate big, big, big. proxy everywhere, like between the two classes, you can generate everywhere. Maybe, it, if it, you it, maybe it's more diversified, right? Maybe it's yeah, more yeah. can generate more diversified and mixed up. Otherwise, mm -hmm. we always have a monotonic or very monologue uh, or undiversified mixed up. Okay, yeah. keep going on. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, may I ask? Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, for example, uh, in the uh, figure A, that means you use a fixed uh, uh, lambda 0 0.2. This is the best one. And for the yeah. B, that means you will sample lambda from beta alpha. Yeah. But, but I'm wondering, for example, the best one is alpha equal to 0 0.4. And that means every time for every batch, it will change. I mean, lambda. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. So it depends on the diversity of the generated or synthesized proxy and samples, I think. Right. Hmm. So if we're doing a fixed lambda, and for example, if we have two samples, we want to synthesize and mix up two samples, and then maybe two samples only contribute a half and a half. But this sample can be different if we synthesize maybe 7, 70, 70, 30 or 80, 20, and it will have a different performance. And we can, all, we can always have a chance to sample 50, 50, but when we have a alpha <clears throat> to control the randomness and we have a more diversity and I have a more variety of more to mix the samples into various degrees. Okay. Let's keep going. Mm. So, um, because the proxy synthesis is actually like a data augmentation technique, so it's possible to compare with other kind of regularizer. The 
first one is without any renderizer. Second one is using virtual softmax. Um, it is they will they will insert a additional class between every decision boundary, and they will use it as a, an additional class, and they train the classification network with four plus one classes. And second baseline is input mix us, uh, where they mix up on the input images. And third one is manifold mix up, where they first randomly sample a hidden layer in neural network and do the mix up. So the basic idea is that we get for the mix up, right? Or yeah. uh, uh, unless we have virtual mm -hmm. softmax. So virtual mm -hmm. softmax is actually we additionally introduce more fancy classes. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. You and you think those and certain classes are just one class. Call call it additional class. And how do we generate the samples for those let's see classes? Mm, I'm not sure. Okay. Mm. Okay, people. And this is a comparison with other proxy based laws because they claim that proxy synthesis can be added on any proxy based laws. So they will check before and after adding proxy synthesis. But I find they will only increase about 1%, 1% performance. But when you run a um, training for many, many times, the variation between different trials can already be 1%. So I think the result is not very strong. Uh, uh, by the way, can you, can you repeat the last point? And um, you, let, me, let me get it off the floor there. So you're saying that uh, when we have a- We are we, we, we we trying a network with some laws and you're trained for different trials, maybe with different random states, and then your performance will have some variation. And the variation between worst to best trial can already be 1%. So I think this improvement is quite small. It's maybe some randomness inside. Uh, the point is that how many times is going to train a model? So that means that if I'm doing the experiment that I would run the original models for yeah. 10 times, and we combine the original model with the proxy synthesis approach for 10 times, whether the average can be 1% improvement. You get my point? Yeah. Mm. Also, that would be more convincing. Yeah. Uh, so, so here, uh, did they do this? They just run it for one time? Uh... I think no, because they didn't report the standard deviation. If they do some average, then they should also report some standard deviation, right? Okay, let's keep continuing. Mm. So again, I list out the contribution here. They propose a proxy synthesis. They say it has the effect of smoothing the decision boundary. It is simple, flexible, and powerful. Yeah, yeah I think I, yeah, I think Rupert Van have made it very clear about the synthesis, the proxy synthesis look like, and uh, the the thought of the proxy based approach is really straightforward, and it definitely can address. And the, the approach, the proxy based approach, definitely makes the triple loss becomes an obsolete approach, and that has has been shown based on uh, by a lot of the uh, findings. So I think one way is that whether, I think the proxy synthesizer-based approach is kind of the specialized data augmentation approach, trying to transfer or the generalize the new NSYNC data to generalize the, the assumed NSYNC data to the real NSYNC data, right? But mm -hmm. this approach seems to be novel, have a good story, but provide a limited performance improvement. I think yeah. maybe in the future we 
maybe with these directions, maybe there will be better approach. I think Dr. Xiaoyan's research and her submissions uh, for X these years somehow is related to this work. Uh, if you can see, we can have more discussions uh, uh, later. Mm. Okay, the next one is Yufan's presentation. So uh, Yufan's presentation is more related, more related to the uh, software engineering tasks. And the idea is that it's going to predict which part of the code is buggy. And uh, I think somehow uh, Jim Bo's, uh, Jim Bo's code reviewer task could be kind of re relevant, but I think the results may not be so uh, in, so so novel. But anyway, their approach seems to be interesting. Yeah, they are. Uh, they, you know, the writing is good and uh, the logic is very clear. And uh, maybe we can refer to the paper writing. I think. Yeah, so sometimes the result is not that, um, not that sexy, but sometimes if you have very, very good writing, you can still push a, a work to a top tier value. Yeah. Okay, let's keep going. Yeah, it's published on the International Symposium on Software Testing and Analysis, ISSTA, this year. And uh, uh, there are four others, and I, I can't find the these two other, the first other's information. Yeah, I only know he's a researcher at Southern University of Science and Technology. The second other is the AP at the uh, Southern uh, University of Science and Technology. And uh, he mainly focuses on software engineering. And uh, uh, it is, uh, the second other is maybe a research from Kuaishou. So this is a you know, cooperate paper between the, uh, the Southern University of Science and Technology and the Kuaishou and the UIUC. The, uh, the fourth other is uh, AP at UIUC. Uh, now Li Ning has been promoted to associate professor just two days ago. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he just got tenure, yeah. Okay. And uh, here uh, we will first talk about the background and then talk about the limitations and uh, this paper uh, raised four research questions and uh, gives their answers. And then we will uh, conclude this paper. The first is uh, our background. First, uh, we, have a sh uh, we know the code review process. We have four steps. Uh, the first, uh, we commit, upload, and then we have a sanity check. And then we have a code examination by the reviewers. And then we will have uh, integration testing by continuous integrative uh, integration system. And then finally, we will pass uh, the check and uh, uh, finally commit to the- Is Jim Bo still here? Oh, Jim uh, Yes, I'm here, I'm here. Uh, does your, in your, in your company, does your code review process follow such routines or a little bit different? Um, yeah, yeah. This is quite straightforward way, uh, yeah. Okay. Usually I upload my code, then I, I use the software to check the offset, then I check the result. <laughs> yeah, then let's see. And okay. uh, cur yeah, currently for those for those uh, network companies, right, they they have their own product. <laughs> the, those, the application needs to be checked regularly and uh, repeatedly. So uh, they will have used the CI CD to automate this, uh, this, this, this uh, procedure. Yeah. Which is a CI here. Okay, so this suppose you have a few test cases, right? So when you integrate it into the CI system, they will provide a few testing to avoid the regression bug. Mm. Okay. Okay, so I think the, you, you find this talk is more focused on the step three, right? The coding is the coding is the nation and the reviewers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, let's keep going. But anyway, I hope that in the future, we can also have such a uh, routines, but there's no manpower for code review, but definitely uh, we need to adopt some. If we do not have code review part, at least we have the other, other three components. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, so defect prediction aims to automatically identify potential defective uh, code with minimal human intervention. So, uh, to, so this paper is focused on the just-in-time defect prediction. 
which provide an early prediction about the likely program defects during software evolution and the focus on program changes rather than whole programs. So main point is that it focuses on the program changes rather than whole the whole programs. And here is an example. Uh, this task mainly focuses on the, you know, the commit, the commit information and the uh, code changes, but not consider the whole code. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yeah. So for example, here he just uh, removed the uh, DB get all refers and uh, change it to a new called uh, refers uh, IFS, but. Uh, this is a defective commit because uh, they are not uh, the equivalent. And uh, for the just-in-time defect uh, uh, prediction, um, for every historic commit, it will labeled as it will be labeled as a defect or clean. And then we will use this historic history historic commit data to train a machine learning model to predict whether the future commit is defect or not. What <laughs> the previous method is just uh, use some you know basic change features based here, and uh, they use uh, maybe you know a, a logistic regression. Or Can you specify a little bit about the features? So the idea is that, uh, so basically it has already changed into, I think the process is that does not contain too much novel, novelty there. So it will collect a few commits and some of the commits introduce a bug and some of some the commits not, right? And then it yeah. can be considered as a classification program so for each commit, it extracts features. So it just to do a prediction. I'm just curious and how they, and what kind of writings can make this kind of work to be a top tier conference? Yeah, actually, he do many experiments, I think. And I see. Like, so, I can, you, can you briefly introduce what kind of features are there? Uh, pardon, please. And how, I mean, the feature engineering. So, given the commit, we have to convert it into a feature vector. And what kind of features can you be specific a little bit? Yeah, here is the four, uh, 14 basic uh, features he listed here. The traditional features like the lines of code added, the lines of code deleted, very naive features. Could you see the picture? Yeah. Yes, but not clearly. Uh, okay, so okay. Uh, okay, please, please. Yeah, may I know when this this kind of features is commonly used in defect prediction or specifically proposed in this paper? No, no, no. This is a, a very typical features. So this is not claim contribution there. Yeah, very old paper like this to twelve. Yeah, I still feel that these features <laughs> have been proposed ten years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they just think this is a previous method, and now you know we use the machine learning. All right, all right. Let's keep it going on to see their uh, result. Since this approach has no novelty here, there must be some strong experiment. Yeah, that's also, hmm. yes, that's also another background, and uh, this is called a CC2 vector. This is a machine learning model, basically, learns the vector representation for code additions and deletions, and then integrates that with the uh, previous uh you know the previous approach to construct a deep neural network model for this uh, task this is the framework of this uh background model so cc and, for cc2 vector means that uh, the code change to vector yeah, yeah so yeah, you're yeah. trying to convert a chain into a vector and uh, they're using a deep learning model to learn it yeah you can see the structure here uh they just uh, use the add code information and the remove the code information to a hierarchical attention neural network, and then go to a uh, comparison layers to get a, you know, a conclusion vector. And then he also contact with the, you know, traditional uh, information, uh, use the CN network to another vector. So there are three network and the uh, uh, feed. Yeah, I don't think neural network model can help much here. But you can, yeah, the, and the network seems uh, very straightforward. We just concatenate all the branches together to make a prediction. 
Yeah, yeah. I don't think this approach can work. Let's keep going. Uh, may I ask what the def defect mean? Uh, defect can you means some, a bug. Yeah. A bug. A bug. Defect is a bug, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, that, yeah. so that means when you make a check, you introduce a bug. You're not running code, you're writing bug. Um, but the bug, does the bug means you cannot compile it or... Um, uh, it, make some, make some working function fails, maybe. But may or may not make it some existing function. Some, some of the bugs may make existing working functions fail. And some of the introducing maybe just introduce a bug. Create a new mm -hmm. bug there. Both is, both is possible, right? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. I, I just mean um, if the bug means you cannot compile the code or um, uh, uh, that is, it, that it's input algorithm. No need to predict it. I think the bug here means that it mm -hmm. can still compile, but mm -hmm. it create when we run it, it create exception or it makes an original working function, for example, the logging function. And the, mm -hmm. the user can log in uh, in the past, but it cannot mm -hmm. log in. For, for, um, now, for now, so that's 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 a defect they try okay. to address. Yeah, I think more, one of the most uh, interesting part is that they didn't distinguish the regression. Sometimes they modified the original code, and they may introduce the a bug to fix some existing functions, or they add a new line, a new piece of line code. They are just to write a piece of a code with bug. But they do not distinguish between the two categories, right? Yeah. So the just in time. So this task is just the, using the only the commit message, like here, the commit message and the code changes. So they don't use other information like the code. So maybe it's not very convincing. For, yeah. So basically, if they want to model the code, you should need to model the context. For example, yeah. the method name and the, the, the core graph relations and the class definitions of just. But anyway, so this those may not be the key feature of information there. Let's keep going. Okay. So uh, actually, I prepared some about the hierarchy attention neural network. Okay. But, uh, yeah, you just know that it's from the word representation to a sentence representation and then final to a document representation. So it's quite a easy, uh, a typical networks in NLP. Uh, uh, so here, so when you compose on the document compositions, and how do you aggregate different embeddings? Uh, they mainly just use the, uh, you know, the network to compact the different vector. Do they do the dimension reductions? So based on your pictures in the third and the fourth layer, so there's supposed to be some concatenation, right? Yeah. And yeah. After, after concatenation, they will, will they still do the dimension reductions for the company? Yeah, they do the fully connect, work, uh, fully connect network to do the dimension detection. Okay, okay, that's straightforward. Yeah, very typical. And uh, the paper thinks that there are limitations on the uh, previous method. Uh, they think that it was only evaluated on a limited data set and not compared with all representative baseline. So the people mainly do, you know, uh, construct a large data set and then compare to more comparison. He first okay. uh, rep, uh, rep, uh, reproduce the previous uh, work, uh, the deep JIT and the CC2 vector. And uh, the result shows that uh, these, uh, they are actually run uh, 16 times and uh, uh, present the mean, uh, uh, the mean and the mean and the max and the standard deviation values across all mm. you know, 16 runs. And you can uh, just see the table. Uh, they thought they are just uh, the same as the paper said. So they think uh, this mm, So the point is the point that based on this model, they could to predict each commit, right? Each code commit, uh, buggy or not, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they support, a, there's a point a threshold. If it is uh, larger than the threshold, if it is buggy, otherwise we think it is uh, legitimate or, or correct yes. commits there. And yeah. uh, overall, the four models actually uh, 
have any around eighty percent of accuracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is just a binary classification problem. Qt and OpenStack are two projects, right? Pardon, please. The QT, the common name, the QT and the OpenStack. Yeah, yeah, the QT OpenStack is the data set. Okay, let's keep going. Okay. Uh, Excuse me, may I check? Uh, the, that means the code from the GitHub always better than the paper. Oh, uh, this is different. I forgot to say that uh, this paper find that the code in the GitHub is different from the the description in the paper. So he just, uh, you know, realized the, what the, uh, the description in the paper. And uh, he also compared with the code, the, the code published by the others in the GitHub. Uh, am I? So there are two versions. Is it clear? Yeah, so there's somehow, two there are two versions. So the, the tool is called deep, the deep Git. Uh, JIT, the deep JIT, and there's a version for paper, and there's a, another version in GitHub. Maybe there's a further improvement based on the paper, and they compare both. So we'll find that uh, the GitHub version is always better than the paper version. Yeah, the so published GitHub is much better because it uses a very uh, simple extraction. Here, uh, you can see that. Uh, uh, in the paper, he said he used the code change, code changes. Uh, but uh, in the you know in the code, he just used a you know very abstract changes. Just just add the code room the code. So they didn't contain the detailed information of the code here. He in the code uh, in, so this means uh about abstract information works better. Okay, let's keep going. I think this okay. is not the fundamental. Yeah. Issue here. yeah. yeah. So the first research question is why this uh you know method work? So uh, <coughs> uh this is what I have talked and he used a class uh, activation mapping examples. Uh, this is a technique in the convolution neural network. Uh, you can, uh, I, I just refer to a picture here. Uh, this is a classification problem and uh, this is a convolution neural network. And then there's many convolution layers and uh, after uh, many convolution, the final layer is a uh, global average pooling. We know that uh, typically, we use uh, you know mass pooling or uh, just average pooling, but here we use a uh, global average pooling. That means we just pooling on the whole picture, and uh, then we'll get a you know a unit number. This is a number maybe like zero point five. So he get a uh, many numbers, and. Uh, how many numbers depends on the dimension of the uh, picture, or you can say that the kernel number. And then he used this uh, final numbers to predict the class. And then he used the uh, he used this uh, weight. He used the, this weight to compute with the original picture to get a final picture. This picture will show the importance of the uh, importance of every pixel depends on the class. Oh, by the way, do you provide any questions for the audience? Uh, yeah. Okay. But uh, mm -hmm. I think this is a very, you know, I also didn't familiar with this technique. All right. So it's all, it's all about the gap layer and class activation. Okay. Yeah. So, so, hey, do you have ever heard about the, the technique called the grid cam? No. The great, the great cam. I think Dr. Uh, Shani is familiar with that technique. So the idea is too similar. So we say this is a dog or there's a human and we highlight the pixel here. And that's actually, this is very interesting, explainable, explainable AI technique. Yeah. yeah. If you are interested, you can refer to some other materials. This is not important in today's paper. So it's just use these techniques to show 
Why Excuse me. Yeah, uh, actually, this is a uh, uh, Darling says great cam. Actually, it is improved from this one. And also, there's a paper called the great cam plus plus. And yeah, really actually, yeah. cam is the first version. That great cam, that great cam plus plus. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I don't know. Actually, I just we don't use in the NLP, so it's it's just the. We can do something. Like, we can do something like NLP. And how about you doing this? You can write a. You can provide a great cam version based on NLP. That's another idea, right? Yeah. <laughs> let's keep going. Let's let's finish what we have now. Okay. So he just uh, want to say, uh, check which which word is important in predict in the just in time defect prediction. So then he find that like the word the task number may be important. So so somehow I think giving this why this can be accepted because it's deeply analyzing uh, how the deep learning approach what the deep learning approach really works right. So based on this uh, phenomenon, I can see uh, the deep learning work actually learns nothing and provides some nonsense uh, for the explanation, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And basically, we can do something like this as well. We can use the CAM versions or the other versions to, to do this. For example, when we generate a piece of code or generate a piece of comments, we can do the backtracing using the great CAM to highlight what is the Special, what is the most important or, or, or explainable code to, con to contribute to the final comments? Right, this is also what we can do. Yeah, maybe, but but I don't know. Maybe the cam is based on the application neural network. Uh, we can do something similar. Okay, okay. Uh, so, uh, and uh, he also, this paper also do the ablation study and then, you know there are three type of information the first is the ct2 vector code and then is the message and this is the deep jit uh, code so he do the ablation study here uh, the first three line is just the single features and uh, this is the result and the uh, later three lines is just uh, uh, remove this remove this Features and uh, this is the result. <laughs> Here is a simple question: Could you uh, analyze this data and uh, find which part contributes the least? Uh, anyone can. Anyone will, will, will have a try. Yeah, I think it's uh, you can point out an audit. Yeah, this is just you can just see check the uh you know the data maybe uh Xiangling. Um, may I ask what's the difference between the first um first half section and the yeah, second? Yeah, the first three lines just mm -hmm. the single features use this single features, and the later three lines is the total features. This total features and the uh, you know deduct the uh -huh. features. Yeah, this is um, the deduct. Then maybe the last one, the deep JIT code uh, performs the best. The, um, yeah, and the what mm -hmm. contributes the least? The least should be the uh, CC2 back code. Yeah, so you mm -hmm. can see for the single, uh, single feature here, this result is the worst. And uh, if you just deduct the feature from the CC2 vector, the, the score is quite high. Yeah, so maybe- So uh, what I mean is the code does not matter, right? So it means that if we want to predict whether it is a uh, bug and uh, analyzing code does not matter. And then all the information provided by code does not matter. I don't think it's about the code because the CC2 vector also didn't add the code. They just added the code change information. He, he, this mm -hmm. ability study- yeah, yeah, but, but change the code is still code, right? Uh, it's just like add, uh, remove the word. Add, remove the word. Yeah. Okay, so, but they do not contain any code information inside. Uh, no, no, some, you know, 
which which code is add and which code is removed will contest in the is uh, in the CC two vector. So maybe it's the code information. Uh, so may, may, let me make this clear. So the code information or the code text will be the code text be a part of input of CC two vector. Not the code text is is here. Uh, I just showed in the before. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just uh, this. This line. Yeah, yeah. I'm just talking about this line. Okay, it's so, not the context. It's not the. Yeah, I'm not talking about the context. I'm, called, I'm just talking about the change of the code. Yeah, so yeah. the text or the change of the code will be a part of the input of the CC2 vector. Yeah, I'm yeah. Right? Yeah, I'm right, right. Okay. So on the other hand, so we can somehow, based on their conclusion, say that uh, based on this model, yeah, yeah, yeah. it doesn't bother to log into the code. Yes. To, to, the, to the change of the code, it doesn't matter. Based on the based on what the code means, right? Yes, yes. So you, you can just use the commit message and the, the word like add and the remove. This is better. Don't okay. need to consider the code which uh, special code you remove. Yeah, I, I think it's a bit you know unbelievable. Uh, I think the, so. Maybe I have a comment here. So. If we look into the code, if we do not understand what this project, what is the project is about, and we purely look at the code change, even for human beings, we can tell nothing. Think yeah. about it. So, for example, if I will, from here, I will go to A equals B plus C, right? When I make a change, we say that A should be B minus C, right? How do you know how these changes occur or not? We don't know, right? Unless we know what the code is about. So if we if we do not have, have the answer, the model better to get rid of those kind of information because just it is just noise. Yeah, but I think the CC two vector think that sometimes you know the code change is very clear. It is wrong. For example, the previous example here, because they are quite different. They are not equivalent. Uh, how 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 can we say that? So what if it is a bug fixing? I, I, I could, it could be that the DB dot get all references supposed to be a wrong invocation. And it also can be a, a fix. Because it has history, you know. Yeah, and how do you know, how do I know the history is not a bug? So I'm just saying that if we find people saying, is this a bug or is this a fix? And everyone will get every answer, 50-50%. Yeah, maybe. Or, <laughs> or there's maybe there are um, other chances that the semantic does not check. Maybe the DP get all references. Yeah, exactly the set of references. It, it may be a just refactoring. Yeah, okay. Right? So just from this piece of code, we get nothing. Yeah, so yeah. Unless we are very clear about this code specification. If we do not have the code with the, 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 the project specifications, we better not feel it for it anyway, because it is just noisy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, I think so. So the for, for the second res, uh, research question, he said he think, uh, how do this model perform on the extended data set? He just add a three, uh, a four data set for extended data set to check the performance, and the, the you know the program language also extended to the Java and the Go Lang, and the Go. And uh, here is the uh, sorry here is the result. The uh, yeah he just uh, you know analyze the experiment result. So here is the question: In what data set the traditional method? The traditional method is here. These two are traditional methods. It's, the first is logistic regression. The second is deep belief neural network. This is a traditional network. Get a per better performance. Uh, anyone volunteer? Any volunteer there? If no volunteer, uh, you find you can call the audience. Okay, maybe you should go on. Uh, tokens. Tokens. Which which data set? Tokens. The 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 QT Open Stack and the JDT platform. These are the data set. 
this as data set. And uh, in which data set you can see that the traditional method even have a better performance than the neural network. WP is the... Within project, city yeah. and cross the project. Oh. So you are focusing on within or cross? You just count the number and <laughs> which way is <it's> larger. <laughs> Uh, open stack. Yeah, this is AUC score. Open stack. Yeah, open stack. So you can see that, you know, this is in the, you know, the original data set, even the traditional method is better than the but cross project is lower. Project, project means, uh, I think. I also sorry I didn't prepare for the cross. I think it's because it's just a, a for different project when training. Yeah, <laughs> I so know. so I think we do not we do not focus on the detail. So the basic mm. idea is so what we find want to convey is that mm. uh, intuitively we think that the the code change content the content of code the change code supposed to be make a contribution to the model prediction. But it's not, and also uh, intuitively, if you equip it with a better model, like deep learning model, the performance support be improved. But it's not right. So this is two major points you uh, would like to convey. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Please go on. Okay. So, uh, here is about the data size. Um, unfortunately, we can see that enlarge the data data set size. The performance still quite the same, even get worse. So in okay. life, the data set size can't yeah can't get get up. Let's keep going. Yeah, yeah. The third research question is, uh, you know, how traditional traditional method works, and uh, here is a clear version of the fourteen basic change features. I think they are quite uh. Uh, straightforward. Let's keep on to let go to the yeah, major, is, uh, the, the most important or the features. Yeah, here is the result of the features. Uh, the, the this is the traditional features, and the, here is the different data set, and uh, you can see the paper said that this is uh, you know the best uh, best signal. So this paper just uh, think. That uh, can a simple approach outperform the, the you know neural network. So he just uh, used the LA features. Uh, what is LA? LA is just the line addition. The so, name of line addition. So the more we, the more we modify, the more but we yeah yeah yeah. Okay. yeah. So I think it's not very. Do not look okay. Good. Let's 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 pass it. So that's quite straightforward and to bring us no information there. Let's keep going on. Okay. So. I think there's no information. Uh, they just uh, do the experiment and uh, show this this simple prediction. Not only have a better performance, but you know very flat, very efficient, because it's only a logistic regression. And the result in every data set, it achieves a bit a very you know. I think it's a quite good performance. I, I got it, I got it. So, but this knows <laughs> it bring it, it, it is it is it is correct, but uh, less informative features. Yeah, right? yeah, I think so. So I think it's it's not reasonable and uh, not practicable, and uh, this is a, a conclusion. He thinks that. <laughs> Uh, outperform and uh, faster they are to and here is the takeaway so this uh this paper performs an extensive study of the cc2 vector on a large scale data set and uh, the results show that this you know the neural network models cannot consistently outperform the traditional method and uh, neither of them can consistent, consistently outperform the traditional git defect prediction like a uh, logistic regression and uh, the add line numbers feature, the AL features outperform the other traditional features. So they think that some simple you know, features may 
do a better job, do a better performance. Okay. So Excuse, that's all. Sorry, excuse me, I ask uh, how this paper figure out its contribution. Because yeah, I, think, as, I think it's more like an incredible study. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. as I know, when um, Darling, did you remember? Actually, I also did bug localization. Actually, <laughs> I use the uh, picture, something like that. Uh, the, the number of 80 lines, something like this. And also, uh, the more recent the code is changed, the more uh, chance, the high uh the higher chance that this kind of code will be will have bug and also mm -hmm. the frequent of some uh, files is modified then it will have high chance to have bug i i think this this is common used in developing uh, the, the point i think the from my point uh, this paper makes several contributions like follows so the first is that uh it, it didn't bring such new insights and what support be a better fault localization and fault prediction approach. It doesn't do bring any new insight. But it actually removed it, it, it's more like a it's more, more like a breaker. It's not a builder. So the breaker is that it tell it tell us that uh, existing deep learning approach uh, does not work. And a lot of uh, conventional common sense uh, is not correct. So from my point of view it's just a breaker. And uh, you can think about it. It's more the result is seems to me seems quite ironic to me. Uh, you can see the most effective or most important uh, features to predict uh, the defects is is a number of other lines, right? So when in, in the previous I see another feature is that so the, the lumber fire. So if there's a lumber, so to, to prove which whether we predict whether a fire contains the bug. And the final outcome is that the longer the fire, and the more likely it contains the bug because, uh, because uh, the likely is that the probability of uh, a fire with maybe hundred or, or ten hundred lines is more likely to contain the bug than a fire with maybe a few lines. That is correct, right? The more bugs we have, the more lines we have, the more likely bug we have, right? So that is a very very straightforward. But very, very, very have very, very little uh, information. So, I, so for me, it's just a breaker. It's just a, a breaker, just remove, just just saying that all the past fault prediction approach uh, have the limitations. And then from the industry point of view, we, we definitely will not use this kind of information, right? I include a piece of the code contains maybe ten lines or twenty lines, just based on the number of lines I included. We say how how likely it is contains a bug. It makes no sense, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so here I think we need to have more insights because in the traditional software engineering research, many approach just to borrow the deep learning model or machine learning model in a straightforward way. It can produce papers, but nowadays this style may, uh, can more and more challenge. It is more and more challenges to to to, to using this approach to 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 have a paper. In, in, in starting for the top tier menus. And here, this is ISTA is the is a top tier menus, but it is kind of kind of can consider the set the third tier top menus. And they they I think this paper have a chance in ISTA, but will have it, it will be more challenging to squeeze into XC or FC. So that is my uh, thought. Yes. Hmm. Okay, so uh, uh, my, comment, my final comment here is that if we want to have a scenarios to adopt a different approach and a straightforward, taking the model in a straightforward way, kind of risky. And uh, we need to think carefully about how to use the models, design the models. Yeah. And it's, it's especially if you find, so if we just borrow the traditional translation models, it might be some risks here. So we need to think carefully about the domain knowledges. So if I'm the one who designed this approach, we're definitely looking to more complex and also infer the, the potential specification. And then the code information will make will, will, will make, make sense. Otherwise, just bring about the code information so we predict predict the bug, make no sense. Right. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, that's maybe that's all we have. Is there anyone have questions for today's discussion? I think today we have a hot discussion there. Okay. If no, maybe we can call it a day and then let's meet uh, next week. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.